Okay, thank you, Nirenj Nabin. Um, it's a pleasure having you uh, be part of our um, Gujarati Yatra project. The date today is the 2nd of April 2017. Tell me a bit about your uh, yourself. Where were you born? I was born in a beautiful country called Uganda, in Jinja. Now, Jinja is on the River Nile. So, I had that opportunity to be with River Nile as if River Nile was part of my life when I was growing up as a child. And it's a beautiful, beautiful country. And at that time, there were so many um, wildlife around us. The hippos used to come from River Nile to our uh, back garden. By the way, my mom was a headmistress in the public school in Jinja. So we were in the quarter of the school quarters. And the hippos used to come. Imagine hippos coming to our garden. And as children, we were so excited that in the morning, first thing, we would go out and count how many hippos were there, counting one sprint as one hippo. So we will rush to mom that mom there were ten hippos over here and we have seen elephants and so many crocodiles on River Nile. We used to go for picnic every Sunday and we have enjoyed um, the wildlife and the natural life in Jinja. Could you could you tell us when, what about, which time was this? Which year? Ah, this when, was... When were you born? This was in 30s. 1930, 31. And um, your parents um, must have gone to uh, Jinja uh, many years before you were born. Do you have any stories to tell us? Uh, your parents might have talked to you about their journey from Gujarat to Jinja. It's a, it's a history for us. My, my mom and my father, they were in Maroda, Badodra as we call it. And they were Arya Samajist. And as young people, they met at um, the Arya Samaj. And over there, the Gurukul as we call it, and my mom and my dad, they fell in love. And the other Samajist, they just married them. And at that time, um, my father, he was a posthumous child. And he was such a brilliant student, whole of Gayakwad in Dharmaj. He came first class first at that time. But because the grandma, didn't have any money, he couldn't study further. But he was a brilliant child, a brilliant person. He was a writer, he was a philosopher, and his poems were published at that time in the Gujarati magazines. And he was, as we say in Gujarati, Sahitya um, Kido Hoto. He was as if he was the worm of the literature just crawling around. Right, to, to come back to the history now, so the, both of them were married. They were 20, 21 years old. And in Jinja, at that time, there was public school. And both of them were appointed as headmaster and headmistress of the public school. So in that way, both of them settled down there. But my father, because he couldn't go further, he didn't have further education, though he was a very learned man uh, in his own count, he must have been 
searching here and there to get um, some opening for his uh, thirst for studies and for literature. And what do you think? He got an admission to Monepia University in France, um, in southern France. And he decided that he would go and do his PhD over there. And my father was very, very fond of languages. So at that age, he knew several languages, including French. He had studied all these languages. Naturally, he was a scholar of Gujarati and Sanskrit. So my mother also encouraged him. So he went to Monapia and he stayed there for one year or so. And he did a PhD in French. And it was the ancient dishes of India. That was his topic. And that was an excellent um, thesis, they say. So much so that it was published as a book over there. And it was, um, it was in that university uh, for three or five years. It was a textbook for Hinduism. And then my father comes back. And he continues as a headmaster. But then he again wanted to do something else. So he must have applied in, um, I think, at that time, the South America, uh, South, sorry, South Africa, Pretoria University, was um, uh, having students, overseas students. So he must have applied over there. And he got admission. And he started with a, another thesis, and that was um, Devanagari, a world script. Now that was a very, very tremendous sort of project he wanted to do. But unfortunately, in 1930, 838. In July, he had to appear for his PhD degree. Uh, he suddenly passes away. And my mom was very young. She was only 28. And we were small children, five. And my mom was pregnant at the time. And my youngest sister was born afterward. Now, you may ask me why this young couple wanted to have so many children. I'll tell you. That is also interesting part because my mom said to us and said that um, at, on my mom's side, she had one sister. She had brothers also, but he died. So one sister on one side and my father was a posthumous child. He didn't have any um, brother or sister. So this young couple, they decided that we will have a large family so that our children will not feel what we felt. So that is the story. That's quite uh, very interesting. Um, so how, how long were you in Jinja? How old were you? Um, up to the age of nine. Now what happened, this is a, the story which I'm going to tell you is um, a sort of how my mom was treated after my father died. And you know, at that time, the women were not at all um, respected in, in that, in that uh, particular um, field. And my mom was um, headmistress. She had done at the time matriculation. My mom's side, she was born with a silver spoon in her mouth. So um, her father wanted her to study further. And if my Nanaji was alive, she would have gone to the college. So much so, they had so much money that he wanted to send his, this bright girl 
to London, but this didn't happen. Now what happened, my father died and she was by herself. At that time, there was another headmaster. He wanted, I, I, I'm telling you this story to understand what was, at that time, what was the position of women and how women were treated, right? So, and my mother had to struggle by herself. And this gentleman, he wanted his wife to be the headmistress instead of my mom. So naturally, at that time, Uganda was a British colony, British colony, protected colony. So naturally, all the inspectors were white. And they didn't know my, fa my father or my mother's background, what happened, etc., etc. So my mother was summoned to the office and she was surrounded by the white inspectors. And she was told that you are due for your leave. We will send you with your children to India and you need not come back. Now, this was terrible shock for my mom. And my mom was strong enough, but she couldn't control herself. She cried and she begged them that, look, I haven't got any relations in India. And the, uh, I have to bring up my children. So please, whatever you say, I will do it. But please don't do that. And while they were talking, my mom must have said, because she had linked in Baroda, Rodra, with the Arya Samaj. And at that time, there was Gurukul. So my mom, during their conversation, must have said that if you feel that because of my children, I would not be able to fulfill the duty as a headmistress, then when I go to India, I will leave my three elder um, children in the boarding school that is Gurukul. That was just a conversation, but my mom abided with that. And we were very young. My, young. my brother was only five years old, and I was, I think, eight, something like that. And my mom, because she said that, she put us in the boarding school. So in that way, we landed there. And it was 1940. And 1940, as you know, the, there was war between the Second World War. So my mom came back. And she came back, not in Jinja. She was transferred to Kampala, another city over there. And she was snatched away from her title. She was just a teacher. So imagine what a blow she must have. She had to struggle herself. And this, this was another blow. And then again, she was parted with her children, three children. And at that time, the World War took place in 1940. So, she was not allowed to go back to India. And we were not allowed to go back to her because of the war. So in that way, something like six years, we were without our mom. But I'll tell you, though we missed our mom so much, and we were growing up, we, uh, <coughs> and, but I'll tell you that that was another um, as we say, golden period as children in our life. The teachers were so very sympathetic. I'm talking about that time. And they knew that we have lost the father. And now mom is in uh, Uganda and we can't go back. So everybody was so sympathetic with us. And at that time, I must tell you this, we, we were in Matunga after we uh, finished certain 
time in the boarding school, we were transferred to Mumbai. And we were transferred to Mumbai and we lived in Mumbai with Pandiji. At that time, we lived in Matunga, that is a small <coughs> sort of suburb in Mumbai. But imagine where we lived, we were surrounded by the actors and actresses. That's why I'm saying it was a golden period. Prithviraj Kapoor, Trilok Kapoor, his brother, and we used to say Prithviraj Kapoor, Chacha Ji. We were small, but he used to love us like anything. And Raj Kapoor, you remember Raj Kapoor? With lovely blue eyes, and he was such a nice person, beautiful person, handsome person. And he used to go to the local Khalsa College, and we as children would run after him. <laughs> so this was it. So the whole street, in the whole street, there were actors and actresses. Moti Bai, the famous singer, was also just opposite. Uh, where we live, and we as children, we would just um, listen to her singing and all that thing. So that was it. And I must tell you about the Holi. You know Holi, the festival? And they were all Punjabis, and Punjabis play Holi like hell. So they would drag the girls, the boys would drag the girls out and throw colored water and all. So we had such a nice time at that time, holy. And we used to keep our dresses uh, for every year for holy, just wash them, keep them, and wear the same dresses and enjoy ourselves. So that's why I'm telling that it was a sort of golden period for us to growing up as children and with the, with that lovely atmosphere, loving atmosphere. Suppose it must have helped uh, immensely with your um, brothers and sister, with you, the three of you growing up together. Yeah. That must have been a great, great help for you. Sure, mm. sure. And I being eldest, I was, I had to look after them as well. But you, uh, people around us were very sympathetic, very loving, and. Uh, as children, we never felt that my, our mom was not there, so much so. I don't think we will get that sort of atmosphere today. Let's talk a, a little bit, going further, growing up uh, a bit, you... Um, the creative um, genes, obviously you talked about your, your father being um, a, a scholar, uh, but was the surrounding with the actors and all these people also helped um, uh, inspire you? Who, who inspired you? Yes, uh, because I was very much interested in, we all were interested in literature. I, I think that gene came from my father and my mother also. My mother was excellent scholar. She used to sing beautifully and she will sing all the lovely songs or at that time. Not the film songs, the literary songs, the literature. In that way, we were brought up into the atmosphere of literature, art, and um, so naturally we were, I was also interested in the literature. But with, uh, with this, uh, um, surrounding atmosphere, as you asked me, with the actors and actresses, what happened? We as children have seen so many shooting at that time. And would you believe it or not, I was offered to work as a child actress. But my uncle said, no, she has to study, she can't our work in the film. So that was it. And um, then again, the lit literature and the love for literature was also embedded 
by the teachers at that time. And uh, I used to write something and they would encourage that girls go on and sing and dance. So th in this way, I think we got, I got the singing part from my mom and uh, literally also from my mom and from my dad. Yes, I got so then you went on to study at Bombay University? Bombay University. Yes, tell me a bit about ah. that. So then what happened, the, the war finishes after how many years? Five years, six years? So my mom was allowed to come back. So she came and she took us three children back to Uganda. And I did my senior Cambridge in Kampala at that time. And at that time also we were encouraged by the teachers. So much so that that school, the old Kampala school, I must mention old Kampala school, which was very, very progressive school. So much so that children were allowed to um, form the associations, say for example, dramatic association and all that. And we would um, manage all the activities, right? So at that time we used to do it. And teachers were so helpful and I, I'm surprised if I uh, look back that we were given so much freedom that boys and girls at that time we used to play hockey together. We used to play cricket, can you believe it? And volleyball and that also with the boys. So, and then we had uh, our own dramatic society and uh, our own uh, debating society. So all these activities, I think I got pushed from all these activities as well and the teachers as well. So we had so many dramas and singing, etc. I presume um, you said you did uh, your senior Cambridge in yeah. Kampala. Uh, obviously, that must have been in English medium, but English you, medium, yes, yes. But then you did uh, um, your drama and everything was done in uh, Gujarati. In Gujarati, yeah. Yes. So tell us a bit more about those kind of social activities in in Kampala during that time, whilst you were growing up. Yeah, um, I think there were some literary people over there. If I may mention Daya by Kavi, he was there. And uh, my mom was the, the, uh, the main source to encourage not only me, but other children as well, to take part in drama. We had our own dramatic activity. We produced a huge drama at that time. You'll be surprised that it was produced by the children and we took part in dancing also because when I was in India, I learned Bharatnatyam and Kathak. So I had my classical background as well, and I learned classical music as well. So I had, and my sister, we had that background. So when the teachers came to know that we had this type of background, they, were, they asked us that use your talents and let us have um, the drama and singing and dancing. So in that way we were encouraged by the teachers. What I mean to say that, that at that time to get encouraged from the teachers and do the activities together with the boys was really a um, unique situation. That's why I always say as a teacher over here I always used to quote old Kampala school that we had very good education over there. Let's talk about a little bit of a social interaction with the um, African communities. Were you just enclosed within your Gujarati uh, community or uh, was there uh, uh, any social interaction? I don't think so because at that time, but I'll come later on, how we had that interaction, what you are saying. 
then I went back as a teacher again in, K in Kampala. But at that time, it was just uh, the school was of Asian children only. Even Europeans will not be admitted or they won't come and they won't admit us in their school. So it was all segregation. And I'm sorry to say, and I feel for that, that Africans were not treated as they should be treated as people. So much so that there was a um, degraded word for them, Boito. And as a, a growing up person, I didn't like it. My mom never encouraged us to call the boy an Aya as Boito, as you know. And so my mom used to treat them as equal. You will be surprised. She was so much forward that she said that they are also human beings, though we had Aya and Boy. But at that time, there was such a segregation with the Africans. And naturally, we had segregation with the Europeans as well, the Britishers. But one thing we had when we had our hockey team, the girls' hockey team, at that time, there was the European girls' hockey team. And we, uh, we were asked to have um, a game with them. It was a challenge for us, uh, old Kampala school girls. So we took up the challenge and we had won the match with them. That was our master stroke that though we are, we were at that time, um, naturally India was not independent, India was a slave country. So we were also treated as slaves. But we showed that we can also uh, participate with them. There wasn't anything like color bar, though we were treated as um, black people. But this was because of our school, I think, we could do all these things. And that, and, and that is also one of the main reasons how I grew up. And my mom is the main inspiration. The way she um, just uh, taught us what we should be, etc. You did your degree in Bombay, then you, you went to Uganda, and then you said you became a teacher there? No. Uh, I did my senior Cambridge over there. And then, naturally, there were no colleges in Uganda at that time for us. So, uh, most of the students used to go back to Mumbai or Pune, where in India. So, the the education committee at that time decided that they were going to select few students and they were going to send us. So we were, I think we were three, three girls who were selected and we were sent to Mumbai and in the college. So in that way I landed in Mumbai again, but not my original place where I was surrounded by the cultural people and all those people. But this was where I, there is a suburb in Mumbai called Kar. So we settled down over there. I was there and I did my education, my college education in Mumbai. My mother's name is Virmati. My father's name is Ambala. But we always, when we grew up, especially when I went to college, I used to say that <coughs> my mother was really the person who <coughs> had the connotation of the meaning of her um, name. Veer means brave, will not be um, subdued, and she will fight it out. That is Veer. And Mati means buddhi, that's the intelligence. 
So my mom was both. She was brave and she was very intelligent as well. And she was also writing poetry. And she has written some plays as well, which she would um, act out with the children um, when she was a teacher. So, and so much so that my mom, as a headmistress or as a teacher, she used to have um, the girls especially at our place. To say, for example, Rukshmani Ben, the, Ma um, the, the Madhav Kalidas, not Nanji Kalidas, but Madhwani. Madhwani's daughter, Rukshmani Ben, she stayed at our place and my mom um, was teaching her. So we had very good relationship with Madhwani family. So much so that Madhwani's Manu, we were together in the school. But coming back to my mom's inspiration, as a child, I have seen her um, taking part in plays with the children, not only teaching them, but she would literally take part with them. And she would also um, teach them dancing and garba, etc. And so much so, when I grew up, I was thinking that how could my mother persuade other women? At that time, it was very, very old-fashioned, um, old-fashioned society, and they would not allow the girls to participate in garbas, etc., in plays, etc., especially with the boys. So, how did my mom? Um, um, succeed to have girls and boys together and girls to take part in all the activities. So she really did it. And I think because she was headmistress in Jinja and then she was a teacher and she was really an excellent teacher and uh, they all knew that with Virmati the girls will be safe. So in that way, we had this type of atmosphere. And I think that um, that is um, thanks to my mom and other teachers as well. They all encouraged us. Um, right, I quite forgot to tell you a very interesting part of our growing up in Matunga, when we were surrounded by the actors and actresses. The, the house in which we were as children, there, <coughs> it was a one, one floor house. And imagine at that time, Saigal, you must have heard the name of Saigal, the famous singer of Indian film industry. He came from Calcutta. And where did he stay? At our place. He was upstairs. And at the time, we had um, telephone. Imagine we had telephone. Saigal didn't have telephone. So our telephone number was given by him to everyone. And we, as children, when the telephone um, for Saigal comes, we would rush with three brothers and sisters. Who will go first to uncle to say that there is a telephone for you? And he used to call us Meta. That was excellent. And would you imagine, he used to do riyaz. Riyaz means practice, singing, at 4 o'clock in the morning. And we, as children, in, at the ground floor, we would listen to his singing. So that was. And another, Hemant Kumar the well-known singer, he also stayed at our place. See, imagine that we were surrounded by the artist, and I think our house, our residence, was the welcome um, residence for all of them. So actors, actresses, singers, they all came. They stayed with us. And Hemant Kumar was there. Saigal, especially Uncle Saigal, we called him Chachaji. 
and he really, really loved us. Um, what else did I forget about that? Um, yes, our teachers in Matunga. Bomb, bomb, bomb. Bomb, bomb, bomb making. Oh, yes. Now, Start from wherever it was. this was 1942, and we were in Matunga. Now, my uncle, he was. Um, staunch Congress worker, but he was also um, a revolutionary. Now, at that time, our residence was uh, um, the place to hide as well. Those who were revolutionary, they will come and hide, and so much so that the um, the bombs were made and they were hidden in our place. We didn't know what it was, but we knew that we have not to touch anything. We have to be away from there and all that thing. So that was also a part and parcel of uh, my upbringing. And I think that made me to love India so much and love to make India independent as well and we were into it. And 1942 was the Quit India Movement. At that time we were small. And we had our, um, our own group who would go and demonstrate. And as children, hopefully everybody thought that we won't be hurt. But would you believe it? We were. We were, we are the, the, our own police, the Indian police, they had lati, the stick, and though they will put lati not on us but on the ground, and they will say, run children, run children, run children, like that. And, but we would not run. But they had to show that we, uh, they were performing their duty, so here and there, we used to get the lati on our back. But that was, that was also a wonderful part of my gro uh, growing up. The, and that also inspired uh, me to be, um, to love India. I was not born there, but I was an Indian. And all these activities and all these um, when I was growing up in India at that time, that must have implanted in me the love, the real love for uh, India, my country, the original country. But then I also belong to Africa. I was born in Uganda and brought up in Uganda. I love that country. If anything happens to Uganda, I cry. If anything happens to India, I cry. I would literally cry. But then, after coming over here, settling down for many years in this country, this is my country, I feel for Britain. If anything happens over here, I literally cry. So this is it. I have written in my book, Autar Rejo, that where is my, the people like myself, where is my real identity? Where do I belong? Being an Indian, maybe India. But then, I was born in Africa. I was, though I was British, Indian, but I feel that I was African. And come to that part, how I feel that I am an African, Indian African. But then coming over here, I feel I'm British. I'm Indian British, and I feel for this country and I'll do anything for this country and my Africa and my India as well. So what should one do, people like me? That is the question I ask so many times. I ask to the politicians also. So the politicians, one of the politicians said to me, Nehru, you have to, you have to follow your 
um, feelings. I said, okay, but my feelings are all divided. It's not just one feeling. You said you cry, uh, you would cry for um, something which might happen to Africa. Now let's talk about the expulsion period, the 70s when um, all the Asians were expelled from Uganda. How, can you tell us a bit about your experience? Oh yes. <coughs> um, what happened, I was, I, I didn't come in Exodus, but I got the first experience of the people who came uh, in, in Exodus. But that was, let me go back to where I was. Um, after I finished my education in college, that was Ruya College, and if you don't mind, may I say something about my uh, experience as a student, as a pupil in the college. Um, I wanted to be um, a doctor, but then unfortunately I was involved in an accident, car accident, and I had fracture of my spine, and that's why I couldn't carry on or I couldn't go for medicine, which I regretted very much. So much so that I was told that this girl should not study at home and should not exert physically, mentally. And I challenged. I'm a challenger. I challenged and I said that, okay, I can't be a doctor. I will be something else. So I had to change my uh, science, um, um, what is it, up to into science, I had to change into the arts. So I went to Ruya College. Now that, and I found my stay over there with the, my professor, Professor Yagnik and Professor Dinova. And you will be surprised, my first interview, because they would interview the students. And I used to write poetry at that time. And um, they used to invite me also as a, as a poet in the big sort of poetic meet. In that way, I came to know so many of our Gujarati poets and writers, like Kasandas Manek, Nansuklal Mehta, um, then Rambai Bakshi, and all of them. And, uh, what happened at that time, I was also interested in dramatic activities. So I used to take part in the plays, in the competition at Bhavans also, and that is another part of my growing up as, a, uh, as an adult. And um, these people, these authors and writers, they also encourage me that you write something. You can write, write something, encourage me. And at that time when I was in college, my um, uh, poems were published in very prestigious sort of magazines. But did I continue with that? No. But I took up the link later on. Because of my circumstances, I forgot all that thing as if it, it was just gone. But then I linked up again with my um, literature, literary pursuits, etc. But then what happened at that time when I had interview with my professor, because I want to, uh, I want to take, I wanted to take Gujarati honors. Now at that time the interviews were very tough. So the professor took the interview and then he must have been asking me about the, my, uh, am I interested in literature, etc. And he came to learn that I'm writing poetry. You should have seen his eyes, sparkling eyes of Yagnik sir. And oh, you are writing poetry. Oh, it's very good. And there was no further interview. I was admitted, 
and that was also another um, golden period of my life for my BA degree. So two years, two years for BA and at that time I took Gujarati honors and I was really into it, into the literature, into the poets, into the writers and there were eight papers you have to appear for. One was poetry and I was encouraged that if in poetry they ask, quote the poetry, you should write your own poetry. Well, that was it. And could you imagine when I stood first class first for my BA degree with Gujarati honors, that was really something, not for me, but my professors, my family, especially my mother and my closest friends. And uh, that was the year when the Gujarat University uh, did not get first class in Gujarati honors. Kiranjana Patel was the only pupil from RR College Matunga who stood first class first in Mumbai University. And I became fellow of RR College. That time, uh, Bombay and Gujarat uh, must be together, Maharashtra and uh, Bombay must be part of the whole of Gujarat, I, I would have thought. At that time, it was not part of Gujarat. Oh, fine, okay. It became fine. Gujarat later on. I think uh, living in Bombay, you must be quite uh, eloquent in Marathi. Well. Yes, that is another history, shall I tell you? Go on. <laughs> well, I was, I was not only interested in literature also, I was interested in singing and children activities. Imagine when I was in college the first year, um, there was uh, an active, very active um, association all over India called Balkanji Bali. Balkanji Bali means the window for the children or children window. And they were very strict to appoint any workers. We had to go for the exam and what we want to do with the children, etc. And I was only in the first year. So, and in the college. So I, I took up the challenge and another there, um, they had um, the rule that you are not going to work with your mother tongue children. So my mother tongue was Gujarati. So for this particular course and qualification, I had to choose another language. And I uh, selected Marathi. And that to where we were in car, on the other side of uh, West car, there was East car. And I'm so sorry to say, that that East car was full of poor people. Nobody cared for them. And I selected that colony, the poorest colony, who, the children who were speaking Marathi. I didn't know so much Marathi at the time. The children taught me Marathi. So that's why I always tell you the children throughout my career as a teacher, I have always respected children because you can learn so much from the children. I didn't know a word of Marathi. I knew Marathi. I can understand because I was in Mumbai. But I didn't know Marathi songs. And the children Marathi songs, um, those children, they taught me. And I had lovely time with them, just learning from them and giving them something, say, um, singing, dancing, etc. And then I got the certificate. And after that, I could have my own Balkanjibari association with the children, which I uh, I had for five years at Jai Bharat Society in Khan. But I can never forget those kids who taught me lovely Marathi song, Pausachi Rima Jamli Re. The rain is falling 
and it's making that ching, 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 ching noise. And that, I remember even today, that song that the children taught me. Can you sing it? Can you sing it? Huh? Can you sing it? Um, <coughs> Uh, it's very difficult because my throat has gone sore, sore throat. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult. But the meaning is that um, the rain is falling as we say over here, tap, 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 the rain is falling. Chum chum chum, and teri meri dosti jamli re. With the rain, the children are failing to the rain. That uh, we are friends. The um, the drops of rain which are falling. You and we are friends. It's a beautiful, beautiful song. I wish I could sing to you. So after your uh, degree in Bombay, you came back to Uganda and you 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 became a teacher there. Yeah, what happened when I uh, I did my BA with first class honors and so I was appointed a tutor and I was fellow of uh, our college um, in Mumbai. So I was tutor for two years in my own college and I was doing my MA degree in Gujarati and philosophy. But then, well, at that time, they were recruiting teachers uh, from Uganda, uh, from India to Uganda. And what happened, because of um, well, circumstances, um, I had to go as a teacher. And the place where my mom was. And so I left. I, I do regret that I could have settled down in Mumbai very well with my first class degree, with my background, and I may have become a good, renowned um, poet. This is an exaggeration, but it is a fact. But anyway, so I decided to go back. So after my uh, degree, and my two years in uh, fellowship, I went back. Though my professors, they were very unhappy about it because I had my, the doors were open to me at that time. But I said, I have to go. And I went back in Kampala. Now what happened, I didn't go back to the school where I was a student, but then my own teacher, he became the headmaster of Kalolo Secondary School. And that was in Kalolo. And he said that I'll have Piranjana in my school. In that way, I landed in Kalolo Secondary School. But I'll tell you something about it. I was just taken aback because the way I was brought up in that old Kampala school and what we did as students, the pupils in Kalolo Secondary School, I'm, I, I'm talking it loudly, they were not given any freedom. Can you imagine? And I was surprised and I was so much enthusiastic that I will have the same atmosphere which I had at Old Kambala School and I will guide the children, uh, my children, uh, into that. Why, why was there such a big difference? It was uh, um, uh, administered by a Indian Gujarati yeah. people? No, that was, that was the head teacher took the decision. Now that head teacher was my teacher, right? and he knew what we were doing. So I had argument with him as well, but he said no. Um, the teachers over here in Kalolo Secondary School, the teachers were in charge, 
of activities. Say for example, dramatic activities and dancing and singing, Niranjana Patel was the head of it. And I felt so bad. I wanted the children to take over because I had done it in old Kampala school. But uh, the head said, no, um, we are doing in a different way. So naturally teachers had to do everything. So I was also in charge of the girls' um, hockey and girls' sports. And plus, I was also in charge of dramatic activities and cultural activities. No doubt, we did good, um, I think we did a, a very good, uh, uh, how can I put it? It was excellent, I should say, because I was involved in the children. And so much so that at one point I was also teaching geography. And I must say this, as a, as a teacher for Gujarati and geography and history, I was very much interested for the children to take up and the children to take lead. So can you imagine for geography lessons I took without the permission of my head, took the children to Makrera College and imagine what must have happened to me. But I wanted to do the project work with children, which I had done myself. So in that way, so I had a little bit of tussle with my own teacher, who was my teacher, and now my head. But then we compromised, and then we did the activities as well, and coming back to the cultural activities, dancing and singing, and so the first, my first uh, encounter was, there was a competition, Garba competition. So I was told that you have to teach the girls Garba. But we had very good team. Though children were not given any chance to play harmonium or tabla as we had, but over here the teachers will do. And we had very good teachers um, who would play harmonium and tabla, etc. And I had to teach them Garba, etc. So I was just a new teacher from who had come from the very good background from India. So I said, okay. So I didn't select an old stuff, but I selected Rajendra Shah's Fragunayu. That is, the spring has arrived. And imagine my girls did the dancing and dum dum the stage, right? And we, it was in a stadium, Kampala Stadium, and we won the trophy. And everybody was so pleased. And that was, I was pleased with the girls and with the boys as well. Now, I must say with my uh, teacher, as a teacher, I was very much interested in the literature. So I said to my head, that I would like to have the Gujarati Literary um, Association where the children will take part. Children, a child will be, the, I will be there, but I would like to appoint the chairperson and the committee of the children. And I succeeded. I said that I'll do that. So Gujarati Literary Academy we had. Uh, it was handled by the children and programs were also um, handled by the children. Though I was there to guide them. And at that time, I remember the second year of my, I think 1960, the writers from India, writers and poets at that time came to Uganda and we had invited them. I said, we must invite them at our school. And at that time, our Gujarati literary society was in existence. And they were all pleased. I got a picture also with them and the children. And so this is it. And I always believe when I came to this country also, I believe that children 
should be given the foremost um, chance and though you are there you will guide them but children have got so much energy and children have got so much that we as teachers can learn from them so that was my first step at Kalolo Secondary School but then what happened my circumstances my personal circumstances um, they changed I got married and uh, I had to be had to come here. My husband came before me, and uh, I was there as a teacher in Colorado Secondary School. And then I had to join him over here. So that was in uh, what year I came? Nineteen. 19 in the early 60s no in early 16 early, early 60s exodus was in 72 but i came here in i'll tell you 61 and then i was a teacher throughout and at that time let me tell you it was very difficult for the asian teachers to be the teachers in this country so many Asian teachers I knew who were well qualified. They were not given chance to be a teacher. And I have seen those teachers, they either became bus driver or taxi driver or um, the ticket checker. At that time in the trains they were ticket checkers. Very few, you can count on your fingertips were given the chance to be the teacher. Why was this? That was, I think, this is maybe one a part of it, because in the schools there were no black teachers at the time. And uh, <coughs> plus my background, and thank goodness that I had my first class degree, that counted. And from Africa, and you had to Register yourself at that time it was very strict with inner London authority you had to register yourself and I did the application from Uganda and because of my teaching experience plus my degree the first class degree I was granted the permission to teach in here. But you were already a British citizen. British citizen. I was a British citizen. And still, and still there was um, segregation. So much so I'll come back, come to this racism, racism issue. And uh, uh, what happened at that time, if you want to become a teacher, you had to go for an exam, which I refused completely. I said, I got my background. As a teacher, I got BA, I did the BA also, first class BA, and BA, first class BA also. So I was graduated in the teaching line as well, and I was a teacher. So I don't know how I got the strength, and I said, I'm not going to appear for the exam in inner London. So they said that you have to appear. I said, I'm not going to appear. I got my, and you have sanctioned me, you have given me the certificate. So later on, they let me go. So I was applying. Imagine applying. At that time, we used to live in Hackney. But I must say about Hackney, I haven't seen a borough like Hackney. Very open. My, uh, my, my first application in Hackney was disappointing, no doubt. And I was told, I was a secondary school teacher, but I was told, I'm using the word told, not asked, that you will not be accepted as secondary teacher, but you have to go in infant. Okay. And I have never taught infant classes, so I accepted. I was applying. At that time, I wasn't wearing Punjabi, or now I wear trousers as well. At that time, I was wearing sari. I had come from Uganda, 
At that time, I was wearing sari. Never even Punjabi. So I was wearing sari at that time. And I applied. And I went to the school in Tottenham. It was an infant school. And there were only five teachers. I was applying as a black teacher over there. The headmistress looked at me. I can't describe you the way she looked at me. She didn't like my dress. She may not be, uh, she didn't show that she didn't like me as a black teacher, <laughs> but my dress. All right, she took the interview, she saw my papers, etc. And she said, you have an excellent degree, I said yes. And then uh, she said, but you can't wear sari. I said, sari, I'm wearing sari, and I would like to wear sari. And she said that because it is infant school, your sari will come in between, and you can't wear sari. Okay, if you want to teach in my school, I'm accepting you as a teacher, and that was excellent. But then I went home, and I called the headmistress, and I said that I don't want to work in your school. So I had that strength to say, I knew that I'm not going to get anywhere, and this was the chance. But then the, the education uh, officer was very good, Mr. Ashley, Ashby. And he said, you try another school. In that way, I became a supply teacher, for a while, supply teacher. And I was going in the borough of Hickney for quite a long time. And then, what happened? We went to live in Woodgreen, but I continued to teach in Hackney. And wherever I have taught, I have always introduced the Indian culture. And nobody has done at that time. I'm not boasting, but I'm telling you the fact. So the, head, uh, the heads were very pleased. I said, I will introduce. And they were all white children but I taught them our songs translated into English and they will sing and dance on our songs and translate it into English and storytelling and make them dance, the Indian dancing. All these things I introduced in the schools <coughs> at that time. So wherever school, wherever I had taught in Hackney. But then my circumstances changed. I left Hackney and I landed in Hero. And that night I came in Hero, landed in Hero, and uh, <coughs> there was no black face in Hero at that time, black into inverted commas. No Asians, no uh, afro Caribbeans. But because of my circumstances, I came to Hero, lived here. And that was 1968, 69, yeah, 69 or 70, at the most 70. And <coughs> I was applying in Harrow because my daughter was very small. So I didn't want to go to my school in Hackney. So I was applying and I was calling them uh, the Hero Education Authority, they always say to me that Mrs. Desai, there is no vacancy, it is gone. Now what happened? Very interesting thing happened. And thank, thanks to that um, headmaster, who was the headmaster of a small school on Hero on the Hill, and that also a Catholic school. Because my, as I mentioned before, that my education officer in Hackney, he was very nice to me, and he understood that why I have to leave Hackney and go to hell. Okay, so he was telling me that your daughter is small, so you should have a local school. I said, I'm applying, I'm not getting any reply. So he said, leave it to me. 
he also knew the position. He also knew the attitude of the Hero Education Department. Okay, so I said, okay. So one day at 10 o'clock night, a headmaster is calling me. Sorry, Mrs. Desai, but I am Mr. Marshall. And he said that uh, I am from this Catholic school. And uh, can you come tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock at my school? I said, I would like to, but I have to inform my head. head. He said, everything is arranged. Who had arranged? The education officer. Everything is arranged for you, Mrs. Desai. I said, okay. Next day I went. It's a lovely school on the head on the hill, just by the church. And a very small school. There were only five, six teachers. Mr. Marshall took me around and then he offered me a cup of tea and he asked, yes, Mrs. Desai. I said, I like the school. So he said, can you come from tomorrow? I said, I have to give you notice. Everything was arranged by that education officer. He said, if you want to come and join my school, you can start tomorrow. Everything is arranged. So not that racism prevailed everywhere. Yes, Hero was very, very racist at that time. I must say very conservative very conservative. And this headmaster of a Catholic school, where there was a rule that a Catholic teacher only should be taken. He takes me a Hindu teacher. No doubt, uh, I am a Hindu, but I am open to all the religion. And uh, it's not that uh, you should do this and you should do that. All the religions are equal and same, and they are teaching the same principles. That's what I believe. So I took it over. Now, in that school, there was a rule that children in the morning when they come, they are to be taken to the church, and you are to follow the ritual, which as a teacher I have always followed. That if you are a teacher, then whatever rules apply to you, you have to do it. So I used to take the, room. I was asked that if you don't want to do it, somebody else will do it. I said, no, I'm a teacher. So I used to take them there and then whatever ceremony they had to do, perform, to take that, uh, what is it, the, they had to take that uh, tablet or something like that. Anyway, I was doing all that thing. So. And I introduced to these Catholic children Indian dancing, Indian singing. Right. One term I did it in that school. Now, the, the governing body, not that they were against me, but the government, the governing body took the stand that Mrs. Desai is not Catholic. Um, and that's why and she's not practicing Catholic. She can't be a teacher, permanent teacher. Mr. Marshall literally fought for me that she is a good teacher, thanks. That he appreciated my, whatever I was doing. And so he wanted me to be in that school permanently. But the governing body said, okay, she can be for one more term, not permanent teacher. So Mr. Marshall took the lead, he called me and he said to me that I'm very sorry but I don't want to jeopardize your career. So it is best for you to go elsewhere. He explained me the situation. And he also said, don't worry, if you see any vacancy anywhere, just tell me, I will call the school. And I saw an advertisement in Bone School that I used to live around the corner, Bone Infant School. So he calls the headmistress, headmistress. 
And the headmistress says that, can she come now, this afternoon? And Mr. Marshall allowed me to go. In that way, I landed in that school. I was the only black teacher. They were all white teachers, white um, children. But in 72, the exodus happened. And somehow, so many Asians, no doubt, Brent, in Brent there were Asians, but in Harrow there were hardly one or two Asians. And <coughs> so, so many Asians came down in 1972, and I was a teacher in one school, just by, by West Harrow Tube Station. And at that time, we had, we friends, the Asian uh, friends, women, we had just formed Hero Women Association. Now, I'll tell you just shortly, in short, why we kept the name Hero Women Association. I was a teacher in the school, so I had all my white parents. And then I was also taking part in other activities as well, in other uh, known uh, Asian associations. So I thought that we must have, we don't want to have an Asian association, we will have Hero Women Association where we can have um, black, white, all people. And imagine, believe me, our first executive committee was of the mixed race. That was the first thing we did in Hero. And I, being a teacher, everybody will respect. Naturally, they respect the teachers. So we did that. And we had members also, non-white and Asians. And the exodus happened, so so many Asians came. And we were the first women association for Asians and white at that time. Sangam came later on. So we had something like membership of 500 women. Imagine. And we did so many activities together. Say for example, the Exodus people, these Asian women, when they came, they came in saris. Imagine in November, it was very, very cold. It was the, I think it was the coldest year and the, it, was, it was snowing when they arrived and we had volunteered to go and receive them. Imagine these women coming in saris and saris will fly away and they were trying to put the sari back. All these things we have seen. But thanks to this government that they helped them. They were taken in, they were given uh, whatever they wanted and they were put in the um, refuge sort of um, residence. And I must say about this, the ordinary people of this country, there may be racism, but the ordinary people, they really helped the Ugandan Asians. So many people gave whatever they wanted to give, not money, but um, say furniture, etc., etc. So now my first experience with the school, I must tell you that because I was the black teacher over there. So naturally when the new teacher arrives, she or he is welcome. So there was the um, staff meeting and Miss Sturdy was the head, she welcomed me and uh, introduced me to all the teachers. And then Miss Sturdy said, that let us ask Mrs. Desai. At that time, the community of Asian people was there. And I must say that, the, that at that time, the background of Asian parents was such 
that teachers are gods and goddesses, right? Whatever the teachers will do for my children is the best. They were not interfering. Even in Africa, they were not. So that happened and he had asked me that why these Asian parents are not uh, attending the open evenings. And then another teacher said that because they are after money. So the head asked again, let us ask Mrs. Desai. So I said, very politely, I said, who is not after money? Everybody has to uh, earn. But have you ever asked the parents why they are not attending the open evening? Why didn't they come for the first open evening? Nobody said anything. Then I say, do you know their backgrounds? What has happened to them? They have come from Uganda. What happened? Why they came here? No. See, I felt that they should have asked what happened and why. All right. So I took this on board. And when I went home, we, we were there at Aerobi Men Association. I called the committee meeting. Just very briefly, I must say this, and I said that this is the situation and this is a challenge to us. And I was a teacher, so everybody would respect me. So you, I, I just divided them and I said that I'm giving you the list of the Asian parents. Go to them after 8 o'clock, tell them that for the next meeting they have to come, either one or both. Huh? That was it. And I was the local teacher, they will naturally, they would respect me. And at the time for the Ugandan Asians, the women, we had free English language classes because I believed that wherever, in what country you are, you should know the language. Language is the most important thing. They were not educated ladies. They poor thing, they knew Gujarati and Swahili, but many of them didn't know a word of English. So we had free um, English language classes for them uh, for twice a week. Now, this is another history. I think we should uh, know this. Now, these ladies, Asian women, they <coughs> were working round the clock. Naturally, they had come from East Africa and they had good um, income over there, over here they had nothing. So um, both husband and wife they were working around the world, and the women were working in the factories. So they will get up at five o'clock and at the time the husbands were <coughs> um, uh, husbands were demanding, I, I'm using the word demanding into inverted commas, to do everything everything from A to Z. So the women were doing all these things. Now naturally in the class when they come, we were talking about it. And I came to learn, we came to learn that these women, they will get up at four o'clock in the morning and do everything, half cooking, everything. The husbands were uh, demanding the fresh breakfast, everything, right? And so much so that ironing women will do. The boot polish, the polish of the shoes also women will do. So we took it up. So, and then, not that we were against these husbands, but we were concerned for the wives. So I said to the committee that when the next open evening is there, you have not to say a word, I'm going to conduct. Okay. Uh, the men came, we showed the work, etc., etc and then uh, any questions, etc. And they were pleased that women are talking in English now. They can speak to the doctor, etc. They can do the shopping, etc. Then I said that from next week, we have made a rule. We have come to learn, not that they have said to us, but I have come to learn myself. So from next week, if any of our students will polish the husband's shoes or iron the 
nuptials of the husbands, they won't be admitted in the class. You should have seen the faces of the husbands. And <coughs> they were all flabbergasted. And I said this. Right. And the women were thinking, they were, no, Niruben, no. I said, you are not to say a word. And this happened. And I also said that when they go, uh, when they finish the class, uh, seven to nine, the whole basin is full of utensils. Nobody is helping her. She will, uh, she will wash it, and then she may not eat, and then she will go to bed. Would you imagine? All these things were done. Now, when the ladies came for the next class, we asked them. We said, no, they are doing it. So much so that some husbands were also doing the worship. So this is it. What I mean to say, why I gave you this example and other examples, there are so many, that it is, somebody has to take the lead. Somebody has to say what we can do together. And these ladies, they were so overwhelmed. Right, now I should come back to the open evening. Open evening, the first open evening, can you imagine? All the Asian parents were there. The headmistress and the teachers were august. And what must have happened? And I had requested the head that if need be to speak in English to understand, to make them understand in Gujarati, would you leave me? She said yes. So that was the record. From that day onward, Wohn School had the record that our parents will attend the opening meeting. Would you call yourself a social activist in that case, um, uh, having changed uh, the man's attitude to um, uh, uh, um, respecting their, uh, their uh, women? Do, do, do you call an, yourself as an educator or an activist? I am an activist. I am for women. And uh, uh, not that I hate men, no, but I believe in equal opportunity. And uh, yes, women have to do so many other things as well. And being a housewife, mother, she has got extra duties as well. But then why don't you share some responsibilities? That was my argument with them. And I am so pleased that uh, our men understood. Maybe because I was running head of women, I was a local teacher, so they respected me. And they were helping us, helping the women also. But I must come to another point, which is, is it boring? No, 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 go on. Oh, oh sorry. The opposite. <laughs> <laughs> Exciting. Now, as when I came to this country, when I came especially in Hero, I had experienced in Hackney also. My friend and myself, we had done a little bit of work for the Asian battle wives in Hackney and in Hackney. But when I came to Hero and when the association was established, I came to learn more about the battle wives situation. And believe me, that situation is not improved even today. Right? Our society is still as if so backward. I'm using the word in inverted commas. So I, and with my own experience, I was very sympathetic to these women. And through my association, I came to learn so many of our Asian women, they were literally better wives. And <coughs> I thought that I must do something about that. And with the exodus, the responsibility was leveled. And at that time, we were running in full swing. And in our meetings, these ladies 
because it was an open meeting, open discussion, and we had made a rule that whatever is discussed among us should not go out. Nobody should tell anyone. So the women got confidence and they were telling their experience. Just out of interest, was uh, Jaya Bendesai part of your uh, women? Uh... No, she was in Brent. Okay. No. And I was in hell. Though, Pulomi uh, will tell about this, I did support her. <coughs> but she was not part of my association. Coming back to this, the better wives, so I took up that issue and there were so many of, in my own area, in West Hill, because I wanted to do something, but at that time, and I was also just like my father, wanted to do some research work and some something to write, etc. So I got an opportunity um, at Ealing College. I applied for a course and that was Diploma in Social Legal Studies. And for the thesis, I, I had selected the issue of Asian better lives and particularly in this country. So I had to do, that, that was the thesis. So I had to go back into Hinduism, the Hindu society, etc. And believe me, the Hindu society was not as we see today. Women were given the highest position at that time. Women were allowed to have discourse with men sitting there. If I can give a few names, Gargi, Maitreyi, etc. Anyway, so, and I had to do the research work. So what I did, the, I spoke to the ladies who were better wives, interviewed them, took all the history, and then I piled up without the names anonymously into my project. So that was my thesis for Asian better wife. So what I mean to say that the situation is not very good even today. So when this Exodus people were here, we thought, because they were talking about their uh, worries, etc. So we, I thought that we must have a mental health project. In that way, we applied with the grant, but at that time, the mental health was mental health department in North Fit Park Hospital. They didn't know. I went to see the, the chief executive, and he was such a nice person. He said that we don't know anything about the Asian food or the Asian people. So that was our beginning of the project for Asian women the mental health project and we had that project for 10 years in Europe. And you name it what we didn't do. We didn't go into very nitty gritty but we gave them opening and we had so many activities, you name it. The Tara Arts Group, we did the play, we went for, I, we did the, what is it, do-it-yourself courses, all these things were included. You fought for the teachers' qualification, Asian teachers' qualifications in this country. What was that, that all about? Uh, this uh, at Ealing College? Generally, I think, did, did you, follow me, was telling me about um, what you fought for, you know, the recognition of the qualifications of... Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes, then what happened, I continued for nine years at Lone School. But then I got the opportunity um, to work as an advisor for South Asian languages and literature. 
and that was at that time the curriculum development support unit and i was <coughs> i was um, the advisor for the south asian languages and literature and i also was the curriculum development officer in brand that was the first time in brand somebody had an opportunity or was appointed for Asian issues, the Asian literature, Asian uh, language. So as a, an advisor, I must say that I was given the freedom by my um, colleagues, etc., and the, um, the heads also. So, but my brief was from infant to secondary. And at that time, I introduced so many things. Uh, say, for example, the bilingual. Bilingualism was introduced at that time. And bilingualism, at that time, there were, at that time, there were two languages mainly in Grand, Gujarati and Urdu. So naturally, I had to work with these two languages. And for the secondary school, we introduced Gujarati and Urdu up to GCSE level. And in one of the schools, the experiment was that from the first year, it was mainly so many Gujarati yeah, pupils were there. So Gujarati was introduced in the first year and Gujarati should go up to GCSE level. And all the pupils, whether you are Gujarati or Asian or non-Asian, they had to learn Gujarati. So in the first year, Gujarati and say French, second year, Gujarati will continue and there will be uh, German in the same way up to GCSE. Now that was done in a secondary school um, in Brent and our project was so successful that people from France and Germany they used to come to see our project and at that time the PG uh, the, um, our teachers they were not that qualified so what they were doing they were just help us so that was also a challenge so uh, I did the RSA courses for them and for RSA courses they had to uh, qualify as a teacher and take the diploma so we arranged all these things for the non-qualified teachers Asian teachers in Brent and everything was um, the everything was the money, etc., the financial part was taken up by the Brent world. I must say that Brent was very, very uh, open for, about it. And so much so that I arranged the, um, with the Institute of Education uh, and uh, to give and to support, to support the Asian teachers and we sent them for the real diploma in education and that was Brent had sponsored. So all these things and at that time I was given such a freedom I can't believe that all these things were done. So much so that the languages Gujarati and Urdu they were introduced up to GCSE level plus um, the Gujarati stories and songs were introduced in the schools for the first time. Teachers were learning and I had translated into English so that we were using both languages, bilingualism. And in bilingual project, this bilingual project was such at that time, I must say that Brent was the foremost at that time. So much so that in the infant class, infant class, uh, there were two teachers, both qualified, but one was a Gujarati or Urdu speaker, and another was a white teacher. 
and both of them were working together in the first year of the school, for two years in the infant school. And the Gujarati or the Urdu teacher will accommodate the children and then they would be um, they would be passed into English slowly and gradually. So this was the project. Nobody had done it. And this was a very successful project. But come national curriculum, all these good, um, all these uh, issues, the good issues, they were all gone gradually. So I was talking about the teacher's training as well. So there were so many Gujarati and Urdu children at the time. So for the teachers to understand them, I had learned Gujarati uh, classes for the teachers. The syllabus was there for Gujarati, how to... Uh, it was not to teach Gujarati to the Gujarati people, to teach Gujarati to the English non-speakers of Gujarati. So the name Gujarati Sahitya Academy came later on. We are celebrating 40 years now, this year to next year. But before that, it was Gujarati um, Sahitya Association, Gujarati Sahitya Mandal. And one and only person I could remember was Dayabhai Patel. He was a poet, writer. He also came from Kampala, Uganda. And he, he was an eminent writer and poet. And he said that let us meet every month and have uh, the activities of Gujarati uh, literature. And he was a poet. So naturally, poetry was the main issue with us. We were encouraged to write poetry and present the poetry in our meetings, etc. So Gujarati Sahitya Mandal did the, was the backbone of today's Gujarati Academy. And in 1977, if I'm not mistaken, 1977, yes, we had a meeting of Gujarati Sahitya Mandal at one of the members' place. By the way, at that time we were not using any uh, hall. We were gathered together at someone's place. Say, um, a one month meeting is at my place, so everybody will come to my place and there will be food for everyone and there will be poetry reading. So in that way, we were continuing to uh, encourage Gujarati language and uh, the writers were in there. So many of uh, uh, the members, they started writing. Sikhan Shambhai is one of them, right? There are others as well. So <coughs> with Gujarati Sahitya Mandal, then as we progressed, um, there was an idea that why can't we have the academy, the proper academy, and then we can have, we had committee, Gujarati Sahitya Mandal also, we had committee. And uh, in 1977, we had Gujarati Literary Academy. And Vipul Bhai came in, Badrabin came very late. She, she, she was a late comer, but we were, Kusum Ben, um, Daya Bhai, all were together. And uh, there were others as well. So Academy was formed and uh, officially it was established as Gujarati Literary Academy, Gujarati Sahitya Academy. And we did so many activities. At that time, in the beginning, uh, we used to invite eminent writers from Gujarat, from India. And uh, we had seminars, big seminars. Um, in, uh, in Leicester, in Birmingham, and uh, then poetry meet, and uh, prose meet, all these things were happening 
with the Gujarati Literary Academy. Uh, and um, well, Dave Bai was our first president of the academy. I was with another person. I was the vice president. And so I was vice president of the Gujarati Literary Academy for quite a while. Now coming to this country, now we are talking of the third generation um, Gujaratis. Um, the children, I don't think they attend that many sammelans of Gujarati. Do you, do you find the um, Gujarati language is going downhill in this country? Yes and no. As you know, there are so many Gujarati language classes Saturday Sunday and children used to come I'm using the word used to come in in numbers and there are so many associations who are running Gujarati classes I have done as my as an officer in brand I had um, the program of giving them training how to teach Gujarati and so many teachers uh, were under me to learn and to have the diploma of teaching Gujarati, how to teach Gujarati. Now, that was a while ago. And parents were sending the children to these Gujarati classes. But gradually what happened, I don't find the fault with uh, the parents, but the situation change and situations always change. So what happened, there were so many other activities for Saturday Sunday as well. Plus, after national curriculum, the whole uh, scenario was changed. The education. It was so much burden to the children, I must say that. There is so much burden on the children from the infant class. So because they had to uh, fulfill the requirements of the curriculum. So in that way, our children, um, they were overburdened. Well, from Monday to Friday in the school, and then the Saturday with Gujarati school. And over there also teachers would um, pump in the Gujarati teaching and now what has happened a new thing occurred in between that on Saturday Sunday the extra classes in English language or in other subjects maths for example they were also taking place so naturally parents were in dilemma whether the children should go in Gujarati class or go in the maths class. Which is important? What is important? Gujarati is important. It is your mother tongue. And I believe firmly that if you are well versed in your mother tongue, whatever the mother tongue is, Gujarati or Urdu or whatever, then you can do well in other languages. So that was the principle. But now the children were attending other uh, activities and that's why the dwindling of the Gujarati children, Gujarati children was happening. And uh, unfortunately, so many Gujarati secondary and Sunday schools closed down and some schools are really struggling to just continue with the Gujarati teaching.